Thank you, John. Good morning. My name is Eric McDuffie. I am an associate professor of African American Studies and History at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce this morning's keynote speaker, my fellow U of I colleague and friend, Dr. Kristen L. Hoganson. She is the Stanley S. Straub Professor of United States History at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She specializes in the history of the United States in world context, cultures of US imperialism, transnational history, and the Midwest. Professor Hokinson has enjoyed a productive and accomplished academic career since earning her PhD in history from Yale University in 1995. Following graduate school, she taught at Harvard University for five years before accepting a position in history at the University of Illinois. In terms of her professional service, she is currently the Vice President for the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations, or Schaffer. Dr. Hokinson is the author of several books, and I'll just note her, her first uh, published book, titled Fighting for American Manhood, How Gender Politics Provoked the Spanish-American and Philippine-American Wars, Yale University Press, 1998. Professor Hoganson's journey to Midwestern history is an intriguing one. Raised in the Washington, D.C. area, she arrived in the Midwest in 2000 after taking a job at the U of I. Like many East Coast people, and I was trying to find a diplomatic way of saying folks from the uh, East Coast here, again, trying to be that old Midwestern polite. Like many East Coast people who relocate to the region, she presumed upon arriving in her, in her new home that the Midwest was isolated and racially homogeneous. Living in central Illinois disabused her of this prevailing myth of the rural heartland as the embodiment of heteronormative whiteness, isolation, and locality. She quickly discovered after listening to crop reports on local public radio stations about soybean production in Argentina, encountering invasive species of plants and wildlife in her own backyard from the UK and elsewhere, and learning about the overseas travels of longtime residents, recently arrived immigrants and refugees who made Champaign-Urbana home, that the rural and small town Midwest are hardly provincial and homogeneously white. Instead, the heartland, she observed, is a globally connected, heterogeneous place whose form and shape has been made and remade by transnational forces. Her new book, her new book, The Heartland and American History, ref reflects these conclusions and shatters the prevailing myth of the Midwest as, quote, the symbolic center in national mythologies, end quote. Beautifully written, well-researched, and provocative, her brilliant monograph uses portraits of Native Americans and the arrival white settlers, the changing built environment, and the centrality of the region to the making of US empire to highlight the rural Midwest global importance and heterogeneity. Uh, in the introduction, she articulates the key question driving her book, quote, what is the nation at heart when we unbind it from myth, end quote. Answering this question required her to look to the origins and contemporary meaning of the myth. In one of the book's most provocative assertions, she emphatically concludes, quote, locality began in the heartland as elsewhere in the United States as an ideology of conquest, an ideology of conquest, end quote. Indeed, the long histories of settler colonialism, white supremacy, empire, and heteropatriarchy that shaped the, the, the space and form of the Midwest continue to inform contemporary US life. Drawing from her new book, Dr. Hokinson's talk this morning entitled Flown Over States, 
the view from the middle of, of everywhere, surely will set the tone and inform the direction of this conference. Without further ado, I would like to introduce this morning's keynote speaker, Dr. Kristen L. Hogason. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I will never live up to that introduction. And I have to say, it's a testimony to how hard we work at the U of I with our teaching and service. Um, and how much uh, Eric has been traveling uh, to do the research for his own uh, forthcoming book, that we see each other as much at this conference as we do on our own campus. So it's really a pleasure uh, to um, get caught up with him. And I also should note that I see enough of him to know that his book will be the must-read account um, on Garveyism in the, in the Midwest um, that will position it at the crossroads of African uh, diaspora history. Uh, before I get going, I'd just like to repeat um, the praise uh, for Gleaves Whitney, um, for his, his role in this conference and for organizing um, it and inviting me, along with John uh, Lauk, I believe I'm deeply indebted to him, and also to thank Scott St. Louis for his just tireless work on behalf of organizing the conference. And finally, I'd like to thank the Howenstein Center for hosting us. I came last year to this conference for the first time and had a fabulous time, attended many stimulating uh, panels, and so it was just really a great honor and pleasure to be invited back um, this year to deliver um, this address. Um, I have to say the Midwestern History Association has found a fantastic partner in its efforts to advance the study of this overlooked region. So speaking of overlooked regions brings me to the topic of my talk, Flyover States. To draw from the top urban dictionary definition, Flyover states are, quote, states in the middle of the United States that generally aren't destinations for travelers or tourists and are generally flown over when traveling from coast to coast, unquote. The second definition in the Urban Dictionary provides more detail, quote, a flyover state is one that most Americans see only from the window of an airplane as they fly back and forth between the country's major east and west coast cities. These states find themselves like this mainly because they're landlocked, have rather small populations, and lack many interesting attractions. <laughs> the term is generally used pejoratively by the aforementioned coastal dwellers with the implication that the residents of those states are somehow less cultured and educated, unquote. And speaking of educated, I have to note that the definition in the Urban uh, Dictionary spells pejoratively wrong. <laughs> Obviously, the coast hoppers who regard the Midwest as less cultured have never been to the Howenstein Center or a Midwestern History Association meeting. I suspect that I'm not alone in this gathering to believe that the term flyover states reveals the provincialism of the flyers over rather than that of the people on the ground. But I start with this term <clears throat> because its wide circulation and popular culture has helped entrench certain assumptions about the Midwest its landlocked status, never mind the Great Lakes, and supposedly rural nature, conjured by the misguided allusion to small populations, have contributed to its presumed insularity. Its assumed lack of interesting attractions uh, has further cut it off from the world by keeping self-professed cosmopolitans away. The term flyover states suggests in some that the Midwest is best regarded through an airplane window, that there is really no reason to land. These assumptions are part of a larger cluster of ideas about the Midwest, and the rural Midwest in particular, that have helped earn this part of the country its heartland moniker. Those who celebrate the rural heartland as the core of the nation, the quintessentially all-American place, cherish it all the more because they fear that it is under siege. Those who associate the rural heartland with exclusionary and small-minded impulses think that it has symbolized the country far too long. But love it or hate it, Americans tend to mythologize the heartland as especially local, insulated, exceptionalist, isolationist, and provincial. I unpack this myth in uh, my just published book, The Heartland in American uh, History. As Eric noted, this book takes as its starting point what might seem to be one of the last local places, a rural Midwestern county, in its seemingly most local of times, 
the years between colonial contestations and the U.S. rise to superpower status, that is, the long 19th century. That county happens to be where I live, Champaign, Illinois. But my starting point is by no means my ending point, because the book uncovers the hidden histories of foreign relations that have threaded through, and indeed played an important role in constituting, the seemingly all-American heartland. My research uncovered an array of relationships pertaining to human mobility, economic life, political activity, cultural connections, and ecological systems that have analogs across the Midwest. Among other topics, the book addresses the invention of locality on the part of settler colonists and the vast diasporic geographies, including to Mexico, of the people they forced out. And um, I'll uh, give you as an example the uh, case of the Kickapoo um, Nation, which at the time of Columbus, um, Columbus's arrival in the Americas, lived mostly in what is now the Detroit, uh, Michigan, and Windsor, Ontario area. And then following the violence of the fur trade, um, many Kickapoo uh, people relocated further to the south and west, um, many ending up in Illinois as the dots in northern um, and central Illinois in the map uh, suggest. But then in the 19th century, they were violently forced out of Illinois, um, relocating among other places to Kansas and Oklahoma, and eventually some of the Kickapoo um, people went um, as far south as Coahuila, Mexico, where they obtained a EJIDO, a community um, land grant, and still have a presence to this day. Um, and the, the green shading on the map um, suggests the, the range of Kickapoo geographies in the long 19th century. My book also explores the different commodity webs in which the farmers of Champagne were enmeshed. Let's see if I can uh, get this to advance. So this is just to um, kind of prompt your thinking about things like uh, beef production, uh, which linked the Midwest to uh, places like Ontario, where high-end breeding animals came from, and to Mexico, where low-end animals for fattening uh, purposes uh, came um, from to the feedlots of the Midwest. Uh, these um, animals were often exported to Britain, which was the most lucrative market of the day on ships like the one in the upper uh, left-hand corner. Um, the other illustration is of the pig breeding, um, which is the, the point is to... Um, indicate that, again, a lot of the genetic material was imported, and some of the most popular lines of the late 19th century had Chinese ancestry that uh, came to the Midwest via Britain, as in the case of the Berkshire hog. And you see the evolution of the animal, and it kind of ends up as a perfect little weenie, right, at the bottom. <laughs> you just kind of pick it up and eat it. Um, the um, importation of animal material extended as well to uh, chickens, um, for example, and even to the honeybees that crisscross um, the Midwest. Uh, Italian bees were the most popular uh, bees that were imported in the late 19th century, but other strains of uh, bees were imported as well. And then with the exception of maize, all the, the major um, grains and other um, food crops were um, imported um, from uh, outside of North America um, additionally in the 19th century. So my book also illuminates uh, the types of border crossing farmers alliances um, of the period involving things such as trans-imperial scientific agricultural networks and bioprospecting uh, that rural people participated in. Um, so this slide uh, shows one of the um, sample um, plant carrying um, uh, boxes that the um, Bureau of uh, Foreign Plant Introduction uh, was urging potential bioprospectors to use when they brought plant material into the United States. And then the picture on the right-hand side is a picture from the University of Illinois yearbook, which shows one of a, a large number of foreign students um, who came to Illinois to study agriculture um, in the early years of the 20th century, including from um, South Asia, um, from uh, China, um, and from um, Mexico. Taken together, these chapters convey a different sense of locality than the inward-looking histories that take the local for granted as a fixed and self-evident unit. By focusing on relationships, they bring to light a variety of scales and mappings that can help us understand the history of the American heartland more in terms of circulation than of insularity. Although I have a different source base than Eric, my book, like his, is part of a wider effort to think about region and global context. But even as the chapters that I just alluded to uncover far-flung connections, they don't fully capture how people in the rural Midwest imagine their place in the world. So to get at that, I decided to focus on aerial consciousness. I picked this lens because writings on the Midwest have often associated land with fixity and water with set routes. 
Air, in contrast, has seemed qualitatively different in its infinite openness as scholarship on Cold War awareness of long-range bombers, missiles, satellites, and fallout has suggested. The other reason I decided to focus on aerial consciousness is because of the flyover country trope that I started with. So let us return to that. Though tossed around casually, the idea of flyover states fits with theories holding that elevated perspectives convey power in the sense that they afford the opportunity to look down on others and to obtain information vital for control. By mixing the empowerment following from a heightened perspective with the cachet derived from mobility, the flyover slur packs a double whammy on the status enhancement front. Yet for all its claims of power and privilege, the view from the air misses much of what is happening on the ground. Despite their claims of worldliness, those who see the Midwest only from the sky have at best a superficial view. It is not just the details they miss, it is entire infrastructures. From the sky, it is hard to detect even massive engineering works. For the miles of clay drainage tiles that have turned the wetlands of the one-time tall grass prairie into some of the most valuable agricultural land in the world are buried about six feet underground. So the map shows um, some of the um, uh, uh, draining uh, ditches and, and um, um, uh, tiling uh, systems of a uh, part of northern um, Champaign County. And then the picture on the lower right shows some of the clay tiles that are buried underground to help fast track the water out of the fields out towards the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, there's enough tile laid in Illinois alone um, in the late 19th century uh, to circle the earth six times. The emphasis on the downward view implicit in jokes about flyover states not only provides a limited perspective on things on the ground, it also overlooks the possibility that air travelers do not monopolize aerial consciousness. The possibility that the gaze might go the other way would demand a different term, flown over states perhaps. But how to capture the view from the ground as it appeared over a century ago? What archival collection would reveal the worldviews of people who rarely sat down to write about themselves in the larger scheme of things. The Illinois Digital Newspaper Collection is one place to start. Among the papers scanned into this database is the Urbana Courier, digitized from 1903 forward. This can be a frustrating source because some issues are missing and most of the text can't be reliably searched. And yet, keyword after keyword, the courier has proven to be both a source in itself and a generous provider of leads. The more I delved into it, the more it appeared that aerial consciousness does have a history that, that can be traced back well before the Cold War. So let us begin with wires. The most quotidian way that air suggested contact was through communications infrastructure. Following right behind railroad construction, using the railroad right of way, telegraph wires connected Champaign by the 1850s to a network extending as far as Russia and India. In addition to speeding up emergency notices and urgent communications, the telegraph revolutionized the gathering and transmission of news. Instead of obtaining long distance information, primarily from the publications that arrived through the post, papers such as the Courier began to get it from press syndicates that pooled resources from wired reports. Reveling in its connectedness, the courier attributed its timeliest reports of distant affairs to the means of transmission, the wire. The next breakthrough on the communications front, the telephone, also had an aerial dimension since most of the wiring was strung from pole to pole. At the turn of the century, the bell system competed with city and township exchanges in a breakneck race for customers. By 1905, more than half the farms in the county occupied by owners and many run by tenants had telephone connections. The rapid proliferation of poles led to complaints of unsightliness and buzzing noises. This proliferation also led to a number of accidents involving everything from tractors to horse teams. On rare but horrific occasions, poles became tied to intentional violence as when people one county to the east of Champaign lynched an African-American man from a telephone pole. The wires, too, posed a threat. When they came down, as they did in tangled messes, storm after storm, tragedy often followed. 
Yet however ugly, noisy, and dangerous, people tolerated these poles and wires because of the connections they provided. Next came the wireless. By 1911, the county had its first wireless plant with more soon to follow. The appeal of wireless stretched beyond those in the communications business to amateurs. Trend spotters might have noticed that something was afoot as early as 1910, the year the Courier ran a story of Frank Scroggins' thrilling adventure. While experimenting with a wireless telegraph appliance on the roof of his family's house, Scroggins fell two stories to the ground. It seems that his parents forbade him from climbing on the roof because the next time his wireless efforts made the newspaper, it was for falling from a tree. <laughs> By 1915, amateur operators did not have to risk their necks because the county boasted several amateur wireless clubs. The US entry into World War I put the brakes on amateur radio. To keep the airwaves clear and to prevent wireless espionage, which was a significant concern in the Midwest with its ethnic German residents, the radio inspector in Chicago shut down all interior wireless stations for the duration of the war. After the war, radio fans reassembled their sets and school clubs and radio associations reconstituted themselves. Catering to the growing market for wireless supplies, several shops in the county advertised their radio wares. Although radio operation remained a hobby for the few, its public footprint was larger due to exhibits and newspaper coverage. The Courier printed tips for do-it-yourselfers, such, such as using barbed wire, which was the stuff of boundary making, to wind the tuners for long-distance communication. To operate a wireless meant to participate in a world of astounding connectivity, a world in which messages flashed from San Francisco to Japan in 1911, from Australia to Germany by 1917. Though such records remained out of reach for the radio operators of Champagne, the wireless opened extensive channels. The operators of the Western Union wire picked up messages from Guantanamo, Havana, and transatlantic liners. Even the boys of the Champaign High School Radio Club intercepted messages from along the Atlantic seaboard, Newfoundland to Florida. Sitting at their apparatuses, these operators could communicate directly with people beyond the 1,000-mile mark, indeed beyond the boundaries of the nation. For these early amateur radio operators, the point was not so much the contents of steamship chatter as the ability to access it. And yet the message from World War I, that connectivity had bearing on power, that the open access offered by the air could be used subversively, was not forgotten. When the Champaign County Radio Association got going after the war, it had a whites-only membership rule. Two, where does the weather come from? And for pacing purposes, you should know there are five points we'll be talking about all together. In deciding whether to move to a strange new land, settler colonists wondered about climate and weather. Many of them turned to emigration guides that positioned Illinois as climactically southern in comparison to the rival destination of Canada, and yet still in the temperate zone. They also claimed that Illinois was moving north, climate-wise, for as cultivation increased, the incidence of warm weather fevers was declining. Whereas emigration guides focused on the specificities of place, on categories and comparisons, settler geographies ventured into the matter of connective currents. In the mid-1850s, Matthias Dunlap, a fruit grower in Champaign, traced winds that coursed over his orchard back to the trade winds from the coast of Africa, which the mountains of South America supposedly channeled north towards the Gulf of Mexico. From there, the African wind flowed, and I'm quoting Dunlap, up the delta of the Mississippi, whence it branches off like a fan up the various valleys and tributaries of this great water course, unquote. Having retained its African character up to this point, the hot wind began to dissipate in Illinois as it mingled with cooler currents. For half the year, its lingering traces produced, quote, a continual season of almost intertropical climate, unquote. But in the winter, the current from Africa completely withdrew, allowing the freezing currents from the north to fully occupy the region. In Dunlap's analysis, Champagne lay a little closer to the white snows of Canada than to the African-American field hands in the adjacent slave states. 
However useful in attracting more settlers and in conceptualizing their new home, writings on general patterns in weather had little day-to-day -day utility. For residents, and especially farmers, a more pressing meteorological matter was the forecast. Before the advent of professional meteorology, people in particular places tried to figure out the weather from observing their surroundings. They came up with all kinds of guidelines for observing things like clouds and birds. All these methods of weather prediction were relevant only to the surrounding area, and all were utterly inadequate to predicting how the weather would change. Barometers provided a more reliable method for predictions, yet the courier's instructions on how to use them suggest that they were not a common tool. Furthermore, barometers were only useful for short-range forecasts. Farmers' ongoing search for accurate long-range forecasts made them a core constituency for meteorological science, so much so that the federal government moved meteorology from the Army Signal Service to the Department of Agriculture in 1890. From its founding as a civilian agency, the U.S. Weather Bureau recognized farmers as its core constituency. Professional meteorologists tackled the problem of weather by figuring out the relevant physics, gathering observations, and networking so as to discover patterns as they unfolded in time and space. All these efforts enabled meteorologists to depict the weather as a linear matter of fronts and waves rather than as it had been um, depicted previously, which was a matter strictly of pointillist dots. These efforts also enabled better forecasting, which, thanks to the cables and telegraph wires that I just mentioned, could be relayed to wide audiences, in part via newspapers such as the Courier. Much of the Courier's weather reporting positioned Champaign as a place where winds from the more western states pass through en route to eastern states. This was, in part, an artifact of Weather Bureau politics. As a national agency reporting to a national constituency, the Weather Bureau squeezed most of its coverage, including of storm tracks and fronts, into national maps. Yet the Weather Bureau also took advantage of imperial networks. The Courier explained that the Weather Bureau's ability to track storms in the Philippines, Japan, Siberia, and Alaska enabled better forecasts, since storms came to the United States on particular paths following particular timetables. However distant the U.S. colony in the Philippines, airstreams connected it to the Midwest. The west-to-east currents that course through Champaign attracted particular attention in tornado coverage. At first glance, much of the Courier's tornado coverage had a local feel. Eyewitnesses reported watching the funnel clouds emerge in the air before them. News stories described tornadoes as cutting a short and narrow trail of destruction before dissolving into the surrounding thunderstorms. And yet they also depicted tornadoes as parts of larger storm systems that swept from the Kansas area toward Indiana. The Courier echoed the latest meteorological findings in characterizing tornadoes as a defining feature of the Middle West. Positioned in the center of the nation, the tornado belt resembled a conveyor belt that connected the far west to the east. Yet the tornado belt could also be seen another way, as a kind of belt that separated top from bottom. Plenty of weather coverage in the Courier brought such mappings to mind. Reports on the cold fronts and blizzards that swept down from Canada and the heat waves and Bermuda highs that came from the Gulf of Mexico positioned Champaign at the point of encounter between north and south. The result was, in many cases, violent clashes. In contrast to comparatively temperate places such as Britain, the skies above Illinois seemed at times to be in the midst of a, quote, titanic war. This vein of weather reportage reanimated the issue that had caught Dunlap's attention a generation earlier. Which side was Illinois on? Among the articles that spoke to this question were those that covered tornadoes. Through the early years of the 20th century, tornadoes appeared to position the Midwest more toward the south because of the company they kept. Until the teens, weather reports did not always distinguish between the terms hurricane, cyclone, and tornado. By using these terms interchangeably, the Courier's weather reports associated Illinois with places such as Jamaica, Nicaragua, Cuba, and the Philippines. That is, with the tropical places uh, featured in its windstorm coverage. Slowly and unevenly, however, advances in meteorology edged Illinois to the north. 
More specific classification systems for twisting windstorms remove champagne from the realm of tropical storms. As they ceased to be seen as a form of tropical storm, tornadoes became understood as a result of the convergence of equatorial and polar currents. The concurrent emphasis on the west to east movement of tornado systems took places such as Champaign off of the front lines and placed them in the heart of the nation. Flyways. Like the indigenous people they sought to displace, settler colonists searched the skies for wild birds. An 1837 book on the attractions of Illinois described its bird life as an abundant source of food and feathers. Quote, the ponds, lakes, and rivers during the spring and autumn and during the migrating season of waterfowls are literally covered with cranes, geese, brants, and ducks of all the tribes, note that word, and varieties, unquote. Yet being subject to constant assault, non-migratory game birds soon declined, leading hunters to rely more on seasonal pickings. In contrast to year-round residents, migratory birds seem relatively more impervious to overhunting. Spring after fall, the rivers, ponds, marshlands, and wet prairies of Illinois enticed birds to land. Yet even as the Courier and other publications applauded good seasons and remarkable shoots, they did not speak of inexhaustible flocks. To the contrary, they acknowledged that hunters had made a dent in the skies. Not every decline in bird life was lamented, for some of the hunting was exterminationist in intent. This component of the hunt stemmed from the perception of birds as agricultural pests that sucked the honey from bees and the sap from trees that pecked at fruit and gobbled grain. If any bird merited most wanted status, it would have been the exogenous English sparrow. The courier joined in the chorus of denunciation, saying that whoever first brought these birds to America should have been court-martialed. Yet birds such as the English sparrow were the exception, not the rule. The Illinois Department of Agriculture's claims that it was better to, quote, give half our fruit to birds than all to worms, unquote, captured more common and favorable views of birds. These views were spread by economic ornithology, meaning the scientific study of birds bearing on agriculture. Until the spread of synthetic pesticides after World War II reduced the importance of birds for insect pest control, the findings of economic ornithologists figured largely in the rural and agricultural press. The Courier helped spread economic ornithologists' findings that most birds were friends of farmers. It depicted birds as akin to a police force in pursuit of insect criminals. By World War I, this rhetoric shifted to insects as, quote, agents of the Kaiser, busily at work in America, and birds as, quote, our allies in this great campaign, unquote. Concerns about the declining hunt and teeming insect hordes helped push a number of Illinois farmers, including Grange members and Farmers Institute speakers, into the movement for bird protection. We can see that in this cartoon that shows the, the farmer as being the person most interested in bird protection and the outside urban hunter or market hunter is the person um, who's um, not supportive of bird protection. Yet rural people's investments in, in wild birds did more than draw them into protective politics. It also made them a notable audience for ornithological studies, a main concern of which was fi figuring out the mystery of migration. Like meteorologists, ornithologists relied on vast networks of grassroots observers to gather data. They also embarked on observational expeditions. Following from the importance placed on economic ornithology, the major government player was the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which had a network of informers and field naturalists to study birds, quote, from Panama to the Arctic Circle, unquote. Their findings appeared in agricultural and hunting publications and in daily newspapers such as The Courier. Some of these reports suggested a colonial trajectory to airspace insofar as they revealed migrations from east to west. The spread of the sparrow serves as the most notable example of this. But some native birds also appeared to be moving westward due to settler colonial attacks. Hunters trying to explain how one-time paradises of birds had turned into wastelands concluded that birds had, quote, somehow changed their course of migration, that they had abandoned their breeding haunts in the Midwest for the comparative solitude of the Northwest. 
Blame also fell on farmers. And I should note, it fell as well on the wires that I was alluding to, um, because there were reports of birds flying into the wires and dying as a result. Numerous articles in the agricultural hunting, bird protection, and daily press acknowledge that mowing, plowing, brush clearing, and tree chopping harmed breeding birds. And then there was the tiling and draining. Less water meant fewer ducks. The birds that did not depart for the West seemed confined in much smaller spaces, sometimes described as bird reservations. The vast majority of reports on bird mobility did not focus on westward movement, however, but on seasonal migrations with a significant north-south component. These reports became more precise over time. Citing the findings of the U.S. Agriculture Department, the Courier reported on journeys to the West Indies, Mexico, Paraguay, and the southern part of Brazil. Birds connected Illinois to more northern places as well, for some birds just stopped by in spring and fall, traveling to and from the north. And some birds came from the north to winter over in Illinois, leaving again in the spring for northern lands. Such reports of migration made it clear that Champaign was a place where, quote, birds of the tropics and Arctic regions are known to meet, unquote. It was a place in the middle, a place of encounter. But for all their connect attention uh, to connections, writings on bird migrations also fostered feelings of division. As with coverage of the weather, the Midwest's position in the middle gave rise to questions of where it truly belonged. The answer tended to be in the north. U.S. Department of Agriculture reports categorize birds in terms of the unit North America, North of Mexico. This unit of study made it seem like places such as Illinois had more in common with places such as Newfoundland and Oregon than they had with places such as Mexico, Panama, and Jamaica. Such conceptions exaggerated east-west connections and shrank those that ran north to south. The effort to draw boundary lines played out in discussions of true homes. The more they mapped long-distance travels, the more ornithologists wondered where birds truly belonged. Unable to imagine multiple true homes, they tried to pin birds down to identify their citizenship as it were. The conviction that birthplace determined true homes favored the case for the North as the true home for most migrating birds. According to this logic, birds from North America, north of Mexico, might travel to the tropics and even farther south, just as U.S. business agents, military forces, and tourists did. But southern birds generally stayed in the south. Perhaps the most significant and long-lasting component of boundary drawing were the imaginative lines between here and away. It was not until the 1960s that ecologists began to pay serious attention to habitat change all along migratory routes, until the 1980s for historians to make substantial pro progress on historicizing ecological change in the Americas. Before then, bird watchers did not have the conceptual frameworks to understand long-term ecological, ecological change or even the ongoing developments of their day the mining, smelting, stock raising, coffee growing, refining, burning, and the harvesting of mahogany for the chiffoniers sold in town. If anybody noticed that all that was somehow connected to the fate of the insectivorous birds of Champagne, they didn't say. But neither did anybody notice that all the ditching and draining in the one wet, once wet prairies of the Midwest might have reverberations to the north and south, millions of wingbeats away. Aerial entertainments. On the evening of July 17, 1911, a fiery meteor spread ac sped across the heavens above Champagne, quote, throwing off a great light which gradually grew dim as the phenomenon passed, unquote. Astronomy students at the University of Illinois ran to the observatory from their rooming houses. Finding the doors locked, they smashed the windows in their eagerness to reach the telescope. Other people who glimpsed the meteor believed they saw a comet and some reported seeing an airship. Strange though that might seem, it was not the only incidents of, incident of suspected airships in the night. Headlines from the Courier reveal a pattern of nighttime sightings. Quote, uh, these, these are the headlines. Mysterious airship over Illinois. Was it an airship? Say they saw airship. Thought they saw airship, <laughs> etc. To understand why spectators mistook a meteor for a UFO and why other flashes in the night suddenly brought airships to mind, 
we need to consider the larger context of aerial ascents. The recorded history of aerial contraptions in Champagne begins with kites, typically flown by children and for advertising purposes, but on occasion in public exhibitions and contests. The winner of a 1916 contest, for example, built a ship kite that flew three American flags. And yet for all the celebration of patriotism, the contest had included a kite battle identified in the courier as a central feature of Kite Day in China. To ensure that the contestants adhered to the Chinese standards of sportsmanship, such as no glass on the strings, the contest organizers recruited a panel of Chinese students from the University of Illinois to act as judges. If kite flying drew attention to China, ballooning brought other geographies to mind. The turn of the century was the great era of long distance balloon races. Given the dangers of setting down in water or in mountains, Midwestern cities were popular places for launchings. Thousands showed up for the ascents, and papers covered the international cast of competitors, routes, and race results, often in breathless tones. The coverage these competitions attracted gave Midwesterners reason to see themselves as being in the thick of the ballooning world. Even as it reported on distances covered in time aloft, the courier also captured some views from the ground. It ran reports of people being showered with sand and gravel as balloonists reduced their ballast. It reported sightings of balloons entangled in telegraph wires or landed on farms. It also reported on overhead sightings, as in the case of a man who looked up from his farm four miles south of the county seat when he heard a voice calling to him from the heavens. This farmer was probably familiar with balloons because balloon ascensions were a common entertainment in Champaign, seen in events such as picnics, carnivals, livestock shows, Fourth of, Fourth of July celebrations, and fairs. To enhance the excitement, balloonists would carry a parachutist who would leap from the balloon at about 1,000 feet. The event over, the balloonists would head, over, uh, head on to other US towns and to places like Ottawa, Winnipeg, and Toronto. By 1912, biplanes could be spotted at the state fair, and they took off elsewhere in the state as well. Champagne fair directors contracted with companies such as the Moissant International Aviators, a performance company ran out of Kankakee, a bit to the north of Champaign. Though known by the seemingly rural appellation, barnstormers, part of the appeal of these aerial entertainment entertainers lay in their apparent cosmopolitanism. John Moissant won widespread fame following a Paris to London flight. Matilda Moissant was known for her tour of Mexico and Central America, where she, quote, established a reputation as the most skillful aviatrix of the world, unquote. Another aerial exhibitor who performed in Champagne went by the name Satan Day. Uh, day two, I should say maybe Satan two, was from the area, having grown up in a farm town one county to the north. He had become the youngest licensed pilot in the country after studying flying in New York State. One of his classmates went on to direct the aerial corps of the Carranza forces in the Mexican Revolution. Day also came to the attention of Mexican combatants. According to the courier, General Villa had sent him a telegram offering the position of head of his flying corps. Villa promised that after the, quote, subjugation of the country, he will be given charge of the Aviation Department of Mexico, unquote. Though tempted, Day turned Villa down, owing to his contract with an Illinois stunt company. This access to and embrace of aerial ascents connected the people on the ground to cosmopolitan worlds of flight. It also distanced them from those who regarded aircraft very differently, whether the downstate rubes who reportedly fired on balloonists overhead the Arab sharpshooters who fired on Italian planes that had been dropping bombs in Tripoli, or the Mexicans who fired on US aviators along the Rio Grande. As the spectators of Champagne applauded the cosmopolitan cast of aerial performance artists, they had good reason to agree with the predictions that human flight would bring the world together, that it would bridge continents, eliminate frontiers, and mix people and interests so as to, quote, evolve a world nation, unquote. Every day would be fair day in this wonderful new age, and none of the kite strings would have shards. The possibility that human flight might have other meanings, such as fear, danger, and death for those on the ground, seemed very far away, mostly a matter of frightening airships in the night. And yet for readers of the Courier, that possibility could be glimpsed in the news that came through the wires. Some headlines. March 1912, airship bombs kill Arabs. August 1914, German airship drops bombs on Antwerp citizens. July 1918, air raids terrorize Germans. 
And if not in headlines, then that more grounded perspective could be glimpsed in letters from the Champagne servicemen who wrote home about the aerial battles and falling bombs they had seen in the skies above France. Last section, air power. Following the U.S. entry into the Great War, the U.S. military established an air base in the northern part of Champaign County by the town of Rantoul. That might seem like a strange choice given the human terrain. Rantoul was about four miles west of the village of Flatville, also known as the German Flats, being composed almost entirely of ethnic Germans. The neighboring communities were known as a large German settlement with German language schools and German Lutheran churches. The German character of the area raised concerns about security risks, for Rantoul had the reputation as a kind of place where, as late as 1917, people were buying pictures of the Kaiser. But Rantoul had several things going in its favor. The first was its proximity to the University of Illinois, which had established a professorship in aeronautics in 1916. Student aviators could receive their theoretical training at the university and then join other service uh, men at Chanute for flight instruction. The university was not the only attraction. Rantoul also offered cheaper land than the Chicago area while still providing the necessary infrastructure. The proposed airfield, about a mile square, had already been drained, as had much of the surrounding countryside. Indeed, the countryside around Rantoul seemed to be an aviator's dream. All pilots, and especially pilots in training, faced the possibility of playing the field, that is, making an emergency landing. The military's flight manual dwelt on this concern. It instructed pilots to, quote, be constantly searching out available landing fields in case of engine failure, unquote. Yet those who trained in Illinois could exhale. Again, the military's guide, quote, in the state of Illinois, the question of landing fields is almost non-existent because there are large, flat fields and pastures in almost every square mile of the farming district." Unquote. How true. The wisdom of the choice seemed apparent when plane after plane went down and pilot after pilot walked away. And then there was the quality of the air. The rarefied air of high altitudes threw engines out of tune, as revealed in the report of a military scout whose plane went down in the Sierra Madres range in Mexico. The Mexican campaign had taught several other lessons besides. High temperatures took a toll on radiators. Sandy soil required wider tires for takeoff and landing. Dry air made wooden propellers go to pieces. The aviators stationed along the Mexican border also complained of fierce whirlwinds. We appear to be dealing with an absolutely abnormal climate, wrote one. Rantoul, in contrast, seemed normal and thus an appropriate place to prepare U.S. pilots for another seemingly normal location, France. Aviation instructors soon arrived at Chanute from France to offer instruction. The Rantoul Weekly News reported that studying French was quite the rage on the base. And upon completion of their training, many of the Chanute aviators departed for France. Besides directing their own thoughts toward France, the aviators of Chanute also helped focus the attention of the surrounding communities on the war. They did so when they socialized with the women of Rantoul, when they patronized nearby bars and businesses, when they departed to the front with great fanfare, when they wrote of their experiences there. Whether they gained great celebrity as aces, won more modest acclaim for bringing down a German airman or two, or were shot down by the enemy, the Chanute airmen who made it into the Champagne papers brought the war home. And they brought the war home when they flew. Their flights turned the base into a near equivalent of a county fairgrounds in its capacity to attract spectators for aerial feats. The Rantoul newspapers noted crowds of 8,000 plus people who came to watch the pilots in training. Those well used to exhibition flying did not leave disappointed, for in the final stage of combat training, pilots practiced the acrobatic trip, tricks, the loops and spirals and so forth that typi typified aviation entertainment. The show spilled well beyond Chanute Field, for its military pilots militarized airspace for miles around their base. They took nearby bigwigs up for trial flights. They bombed towns in central Illinois with Liberty Loan circulars. They did crowd drawing off base exhibitions with all kinds of aerial stunts. They circled around before landing for gas. More somberly, they flew over a military funeral, dipping so they could drop flowers into the grave. And they crashed. 
Reports of the two pilots who died in the center of the business district in the village of Fisher provide a glimpse into the proximity of military aviation to civilian space. The pilots have been flying, quote, very low, directly up the street, and they died when their plane hit a flagpole. The people of Champaign called the aviators birdmen, a term used by the airmen themselves. And like birds, they were migratory, for they went to Texas for the winter when the ground turned hard and snowy and the air turned bitingly cold. Indeed, according to ornithological standards, Texas may have been the true home for at least, at least some of the aviators, because that is where some of the first uh, instructors fledged as military pilots. These men had served with General Pershing along the U.S.-Mexican border and in the Mexican punitive expedition. During six months of U.S. military operations in Mexico in 1916, one plane in Pershing's aerial squadron crashed into the side of a mountain near Chihuahua, sparking a forest fire that burned for 40 miles. The pilots' subsequent complaints about mountain and desert operations helped lead to the founding of the base in Champaign. But if the standard for true homes was not the first airborne mission, but the first tour of overseas duty, then the histories of the birdmen went even further back. For some of the Chinute airmen, that true home was the Philippines, where they had served as part of US occupation forces amidst the same winds that meteorologists of the time traced to the Midwest. Conclusions. We've covered a lot of ground, or rather sky, since I began. So the question is, how does all this fit together? And what does it tell us about the history of flyover country? Most obviously, if we flip the perspective and consider flyover states as flown over states, we find that the people on the ground have looked up and out, often seeing themselves in the middle of everything. Aerial awareness helped produce an understanding of place that was, in many respects, more open than bounded. That is, a vision of place that spilled into space. And yet, even as they looked to the air, the people of Champaign tried to draw boundaries to limit access insist on distance, and privilege some forms of connection over others. It is important to note that aerial consciousness was not just lateral, unspooling to Africa, the Philippines, South America, and Canada, among other places. Much like the wits who later invented jokes about flyover states, rural Midwesterners in the long 19th century understood that airspace also had vertical dimensions, that panoptic views conveyed high status and power relative to those on the ground, that flyers over could literally look down on flown over people. And in this respect, rural Midwesterners counted themselves among the empowered, for they saw their region as a place to land in and ascend from. Though disparaged by self-proclaimed sophisticates in the urban centers of culture and capital, the supposed bumpkins of the heartland did more than look up, they looked down. Though derided as being in the middle of nowhere, the heart of the nation coalesced smack in the middle of everywhere, between north and south, east and west, and flyover and flown over too. Thank you. So how are we doing on time? 10 minutes, so 10 minutes for questions. And I have to put my glasses on uh, to be able to see. Okay, so I see a hand in the front and one in the back, but I think you're supposed to go up to the mic, so um, that would be helpful. And then once you're at the mics, I don't need my glasses. So, Chris, this sound, all sounds very pervasive, but do you have any direct testimony from people that would coincide with what you're talking about, about this kind of, what, you, what we've just been saying? You know, people who actually thought those things and said those things in places. Okay, so, so you're saying, like, do I have, like, letters or diary entries saying, this is how aerial consciousness is part of my worldview? It seems like it would be hard to find something like that, and it all seems, you know, uh, circumstantial evidence, but is there any Right, so, so that's why I started by talking about the um, Illinois Digital Newspaper Collection, is that given my methodology, which was basically I started with local history and I followed the different threads wherever they led, I didn't have any of these diary 
entries or letters that said, this is how I see the world by looking up. So I had to kind of piece the story together um, through the sources that I did have. And what the sources suggested to me, what I was trying to convey, is that there was a lot of attention. You know, I started with kind of the local media and then followed those different threads um, where I could, that there actually was a lot of attention to airborne connection. I think for me the most surprising part of it was actually the bird um, part, that I hadn't realized how important birds were to rural people. I hadn't realized, you know, for uh, protein provisioning, for hunting, um, just how much attention there was um, uh, in the press to, to you know, how <laughs> bird populations, how the hunting season looked, to, to concern about bird decline. And I certainly had not expected to find anything that suggested that farmers uh, greatly relied on bird for insect pest um, control. That was an utter surprise. And th there was more material on this that I, I didn't weave into the talk. Um, pertaining to the role of the University of Illinois in some of those economic ornithological um, studies, that there was somebody in the Illinois Natural um, History um, Office, Stephen uh, Forbes, who was the leader in dissecting birds. So he, um, in his lab, would, would take them apart and look at what was in their craws, the kind of partially digested um, things that they had eaten. And he would lay out all the teeny tiny little insect parts and figure out like, you know, how, how much cherry material was there in the craw and how much insect parts were, were in the craws. And then he would run the numbers and say, okay, so they might be nipping some of your fruit. But if you look at the insects that they've eaten, um, these are the positive benefits of um, birds. And that kind of knowledge was why disseminated in all kinds of agricultural publications, um, underscoring the point that even though farmers aren't sitting down and writing, you know, I'm really paying a lot of attention to birds because it tells me something about how, how I'm positioned in the world, they are certainly paying a lot of attention to birds. And when the populations plummet, they become quite anxious about, you know, what's going to happen to my um, um, source of um, insect control, they're concerned for food security reasons, and so when there's more attention to figuring out migratory routes, they're uh, a natural audience for that. The smaller world, and uh, it's just got a lot bigger now that we can hear. The the uh, my uh, research in the South Dakota, which is a, a flyover land in a sense, I'm looking at 1900 to 1930, and the state was uh, the music of choice in the state was jazz, in the smallest town you can imagine, hundreds of jazz bands, including African American. The fashion was East Coast. Downtown Sioux Falls, Phillips Avenue was referred to as the uh, Fifth Avenue of, of uh, Sioux Falls. The, the buyers went to New York. So there was no sense of this, of this state as being disconnected from the East Coast. So when, if there was a flyover land that we look at today, the concept, it was not flyover land from at least 1900 to 1940 in terms of self-identity. It was part of the East in every way you could imagine. Classical music, Wagner was played in the First Baptist Church of Sioux Falls, and classical music was in all the churches. So I, I, I'm confused about how we look at this question of identity uh, and the Midwest having this unique identity and being out part of this flyover land when it was so connected historically to the East Coast. I think that's exactly my argument, right? That if you look at it from the ground, the people on the ground are not thinking of their own region as, as being a place that is strictly flown over and you know should be dismissed. The point is the feeling of connectedness, right? And I think what I'm trying to do is to show through this particular lens some of the geographies of connection as well as some of the politics, right, of thinking about connections, things like the unit of North America, north of Mexico as the unit for studying. I mean, that makes no sense, right? Like birds don't, you know, stop at the 
U.S.-Mexico boundary and like say, oh, okay, I've reached the wall and I'm not going to go any farther. <laughs> that, that it's just utter nonsense, right? It's about the politics, the racial politics and imaginaries of the people who are trying to study birds and to think about birds, like how they want to imagine birds, right? So I think what I'm trying to do is to say that um, in contrast to other forms of connection, if you look at, you know, the whole idea of being in the middle of the continent, um, especially prior to things like the development of railroads and, and better river transportation, steamboats, and you know more of the you know kind of dredging and so forth. Um, before the interstate highway system, to travel via land is an arduous thing, and then to travel via water is very. You have to go down the Mississippi, for example, or go on the Great. There are certain routes, um, you know, in in the center of the country that water would channel people into. But the point is, like looking up and out is a sense of expansiveness, right? That you could be a teenager picking up radio signals from Havana, Newfoundland, right? You know, there's a sense of there is nothing in between you and these distant people, and the sense of valuing, even if they, you know, is ship chatter, right? They're, they're, they're not having sophisticated conversations, but it's a sense of we are connected was something that was picked up again time and time again in the press and suggests kind of wider communities of, of enthusiasm for being in the middle of everything. So I think we're very much on the same page with, with trying to think of ways that people who've been written off as local and provincial, isolated and so forth, have in fact been profoundly connected you know, to other parts of the world. And in their kind of imaginings of themselves, I think if we look up and look at airspace, there is something specific about that that is about the possibility of unmediated long distance connections. I apologize. Yeah, yeah. And then I'm getting a signal from Scott that we're out of time. So thank you all very much.